Let me ask you this question. How do you discover God's will for your life? I want to talk about that this morning as we look at our text today. How do you know if God wants you to do something or if it's just something that you want to do? How do you figure that out? I mean, it's something we kind of all face. We all go through decisions in life, decisions that come. And yes, you know, as believers, we say we want to follow God's will. And so how do we know what God's will is? And I want to tackle this question today as we go through 1 Samuel 23 and 24. Now, my wife and I have a pretty deep theological way that we decide God's will in just our everyday decisions. Example, if we're lying in bed and there's still a light left on, I know it's God's will for her to get up and turn it off. She thinks it's God's will for me to get up and turn it off. So we do something very, I think it's somewhere in the scriptures, I haven't found it yet, but we play rock, paper, scissors. Anybody done that? It's really good. And so we'll sit there and we'll play rock, paper, whoever loses, usually we do best out of three, whoever loses has to get up and turn the light off. That's how we figure out what God's will is, and I win most of the time. She's not here. She's down in Greensburg um, this morning leading worship. Uh, But that, okay, so that's one way, not probably the best way to do it, and that's not what we're going to find in 1 Samuel and, and in 2 Samuel. But today, there is a huge contrast between how David discovered God's will and what he was supposed to do, and how Saul discovered, or how Saul thought that he was doing God's will. Because in our text, we actually see David believed that he was doing God's will, but we also see that Saul thought that he was. And so how do we know which one was right, and the scriptures does show us, we do know Saul was deceived, but in this text, we see both people saying, oh, God must have allowed this to happen, and so I'm going to do this. So I think it's an important question, and one that we wrestle with, and one that is there often in our life, of how we discover, how we decide, how do we know what God's will is for our life. And so let's go right to our text. We've got two chapters, so we're going to jump right in this morning and walk through these two chapters and discover some six, I believe, six timeless truths about God's will. Let's start verse, our chapter 23, verse 1. Remember, David is on the run. It says, now they told David, behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah. Now, again, David is um, right here in Keilah. He's probably in the wilderness, they would say, just a little bit. Um, north of that is what we discovered last week. That's kind of where we ended off in this story where David was. So David, though, would probably come down to Keilah there to get some um, supplies and then go back into the wilderness. He was running from Saul. He had 400 men with him. And, and so here's where he was located. Well, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and were robbing them, uh, robbing the threshing floors. And so the Philistines were coming in and, and stealing from them, taking um, their wheat, taking their, um, their belongings. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack these Philistines? The Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again. So he, came to, he comes to God again and said, okay, God, is this what we're supposed to do? Arise and go to Keilah. I will give the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. So here's the first thing I want us to see as we walk through this, as we're deciding, as we see David numerous times go to God, figure out, God, what is your will? The first truth that I want us to grasp is this, it is okay to ask twice. Okay, it's okay, a simple truth, but one that I, I like, it kind of shows the rawness of this story. That God told David once, it's okay for you, go and fight the Philistines. David and his men are a little bit afraid, so they go back again and say, God, is this really what you want? Do you still want us to go down and fight the Philistines? And God says, yes, go and fight the Philistines. I will give them into your hand. Listen, as we come to this understanding of God's will, it's okay to ask twice. We see David do it here. And just the rawness of a story. Verse 6, and so when Abiathar, the son of Abimelech, had fled to David, to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now that's an important verse. We know from last chapter that Abiathar was one of the priests that escaped. You remember, if you were here last week, Saul wiped out 85 priests in Nob. 
He killed them all. There was one that escaped. That was Abiathar. Abiathar goes and finds David and finds shelter with David. So now David has a priest that is with him. Well, it says here in verse 6 that he brought the ephod with him. You say, Jeremiah, what is the ephod? We actually looked at the ephod back early on in our text, in our book. The ephod was a breastplate that the priest would wear. And at the top of the ephod, or somewhere in the, in the breastplate, there were uh, um, two little things called the Urim and Thummim. And, and this was how God gave the priest, showed them how they could discover God's will. They would take these two, and most theologians, most historians would say they are two rocks or something, and they would roll them, uh, or they were two different color rocks, and, and whatever one came forth, and it was a way they discovered God's will. You say, Jeremiah, that's kind of weird. It, you can go back, and we don't have time to go back and look through all the history. You can listen to the message I talked on where, about it before, but it was a way that God gave them, a method that God gave them on how to discover God's will. Most actually believe, scholars would believe, that verses one through five, that's actually what David did there. It wasn't that David heard an audible voice from God, but as a Jewish writer and a Jewish reader would have re- read this passage, they would have thought that, yes, this method of how they discover with the Urim and Thummim, that that was just as much as the voice of God. And so as they would have written it here, it, it would have sounded like because these are just questions, yes or no questions, that David asked God. And, and so then they would roll the Thummim and the Urim and, and figure out what they're supposed to do. It was a method that God gave them specifically of how to discover his will and what they were supposed to do. Now, continuing our verse, it says, Saul, though, now it was told to Saul that David had come to Keilah, and Saul said, look at this, Saul thinks it's God's will. God has given him into my hand. So someone comes and tells Saul, Saul, listen, David is in Keilah, so David, so Saul thinks, listen, God has told me. And so God has given it to my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that, er, that has gates and bars. And so Saul summons his men and says, listen, I'm going to go down. We're going to take down uh, David because we know he's in Keilah. Well, David goes, gets, his, gets the priest, Abiathar, it says in this text, and, and says, let's go to God, get your ephod. As it says in verse, the end of verse 9, bring the ephod. So David asked God questions again. And yes, in the text, it looks like God responds audibly. But because of what in the context of our text, we realize that it really was the ephod. It was the, the Urim and the Thummim that they would roll. that They'd figure out what God was, wanted them to do. And so they asked God. They said, God, will the Keilah people, will they turn us in? God said, yes, they will as they discovered it, and so they said, we better run, and so they take off, and they realize that Saul's going to capture them, and it says in verse 14, and Saul sought them every day, but God did not give them into his hands. So again, we see two men, David, looking at how God gave them instructions of how to discover his will, where Saul was just using the circumstances around them. Listen, be careful when you only base God's will on your circumstances. We're going to see that a little bit more in our text. But here's the second thing I want you to see that we see about the timeless truths of God's will is that use God's methods. Use God's methods. You say, Jeremiah, okay, David had God's methods with the ephod is how God gave them um, how to discover his will for them. So, Jeremiah, I don't see you wearing an ephod. I don't think you have a Urim and Thummim to show us what we're supposed to do. So the question then is, what is God's methods for us today? Because he's not just leaving us here so I hope you can figure it out. No, he's given us methods. He gave them methods during that day. He's given us methods of how we can discover God's will. So you say, Jeremiah, what are those? Well, I'm going to close the end of the message with those. So let's keep reading. You remember, we're going to get to those of how, but I want to leave with that today of how, what are the methods that God has given to us. But here's the third truth that I want you to see as we walk through this text is have friends that point you to truth. David there in verse 15 saw, saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and so David went and hid in the wilderness of, of Ziv. So here's David hiding. Jonathan, it says there, realized that David is there. So da- Jonathan goes down and strengthens his hand in the God. And says to David, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king. So Jonathan comes down, 
And, and, and as a godly friend would do, would strengthen him in God and, and, te- and speaks truth to him. You see, Jonathan must have known that David needed some encouragement, or God knew that David needed some encouragement at this time. And and so he sent him to give him this encouragement to focus him on the truth that was supposed to take place. You shall be king. You know, maybe God realized that because of what David was walking through that he was starting to doubt that a little bit. You know, we see even reading through the book of Psalms that David is prone to get discouraged. And so maybe God said, you know, I'm going to send Jonathan down to David to make sure he points him to the truth that you shall be king. Have friends that point you to the truth. Let me ask you, do you have a friend like that? Listen, you want a a timeless truth about God's will is make sure that you have someone around you that's going to point you to what is right. Do you have a friend like that? That when you get discouraged, when you get down, when you start doing something that you shouldn't, that they're there to point you to the truth. David needed a friend like this to point him to truth. Maybe it's a guy, a girl in your community group. Maybe it's someone you've known for a long time. Listen, understand, if someone is really going to help you know truth in your life, then you're going to have to have that life, going to have to intertwine with your life a little bit. But we need those people in, in our lives. Jeremiah, you say, I don't have that person or those persons in my life. Then listen, put it on your prayer list and ask God to give you one. Because we need those type of people. And you say, Jeremiah, what if I open up to them and I get hurt by it? Listen, it's better to take that chance. And I'll say that from experience. I know in the 40 years that I've been alive, there have been times I've had that friend and times that I haven't had that friend. And there have been times that I've opened up to some and, and been hurt by it. And, and it's not fun. It's kind of easier to kind of sit back and go, well, you know what? I thought they were going to be there to help. I thought they were going to, and it didn't happen. So I'm just going to kind of close up and I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to reach out for that any type of person anymore. Because I, I believe we all need that type of friend or life who's willing to come and to speak truth to us. And, and I believe God knows it's important. We need friends who are going to point us to truth. And David has one here. And Jonathan, have friends that point you to the truth. Now back to our story in verse 19. It says there that the Ziphites went to Saul of Gibeah saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds? So here's what happened. I won't read the whole story, but here's what take place. The Ziphites realize that David's hiding out around them. They don't want what happened to, the, to what they heard happen in Nob. Remember, Saul went in in Nob and wiped out the whole town. So the Ziphites say, hey, listen, we're going to go tell Saul that David's down here because we don't want to be killed. And, and so they go and they communicate to Saul. Here's where the, Ziphite, uh, the Ziphites would have been. So they go and they tell Saul, Saul, David is down here. Saul says in verse 21, may you be blessed by the Lord. Again, Saul is still proclaiming and Saul is still thinking that it is God's will in what he is doing. Telling them, may you be blessed by the Lord for you have had compassion on me. You've told me where my enemy is at. He tells them kind of watch and figure out exactly his moves and what he's going to do. Make sure you get this all and then I will come down and and take him out. Now, remember, the Ziphites were of the tribe of Judah, which means it's the same tribe as David. Town's probably about 15 miles apart. If you see Bethlehem, that's where David was from. So these, this would have been like your relatives turning on you. Same tribe. And, and them kind of turning and saying, hey, Saul, come down and get him and the 400 men because we don't want any trouble here. David, if you want to read how David really felt about this, you can turn later to Psalms chapter 54, and we see actually David write a psalm about this and actually call the people, the Ziphites, almost like strangers to them. And asking God to do to them what he, what they wanted to do to David. So David, though, Saul comes down and starts to get closer, it says in, in verses 24 and following, and starts to get closer to, to David. And right when he's about to come and Saul's about to capture David, it says that a messenger came to Saul in verse 27, say, hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. 
So the Philistines have come and started to take over Saul's land, and so Saul has to stop going after David, goes back to his area, and, and takes on the Philistines, and David escapes to En Gedi, as it says in chapter, at the end of chapter 23. So now we find David at En Gedi. A couple years ago when I went to Israel, um, I got to go to En Gedi, and it is a beautiful place, and I, I hope that one day we can take a trip as a church, so start saving now, um, because it is an incredible trip to go to Israel, and, and this was, um, oh, so he ran to Moran first, and then over to En Gedi, and, and so here, here's just a picture of En Gedi. Now, this is in a desert land. Okay, this is one, this is a picture that I, I actually took these. I'm not a good photographer. Um, so it, this is, it's a desert land, and in this desert land, in the rocks, you will find waterfalls like this. Beautiful places. It's right next to the Dead Sea, so you can't do anything in the Dead Sea. You can't drink out of the Dead Sea. But here in this wilderness was this place of En Gedi. If you are a Song of Solomon, enjoy the Song of Solomon. There's a romantic conversation that Solomon has with his future spouse in chapter 2, and he says this, my beloved to me is as a cluster of Helen blossoms, which is flowers, in the vineyards of En Gedi. Because what was here in the location, in the wilderness that was around, it was this beautiful oasis. Hey, here's just some other pictures I just found as I was looking online, and I remember as we drove up to this you can kind of see the blue building. That wasn't back in Saul's day. Uh, but that's pretty much the place for the visitor center where you go to start. And then, but in the wilderness around, here is this o oasis. And it is a beautiful, a whole bunch of different waterfalls and beautiful place. You find that's where we find David here. As he has the water there to drink. And so Saul finds out that he is down in that way. So Saul comes after him in chapter 24, and in verse 3, it says that uh, Saul at the end goes into this cave to relieve himself. He went to use the restroom in the cave, and David had, and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. When I went to En Gedi, you could see different caves in the mountains. So David and his men were in one of these caves, and, and here Saul goes in as he's trying to capture, trying to find David. Saul walks in, takes a little break there. And so while he is there, it says, now David and the men were sitting in those parts, in verse 4, and the men said to David, here is the day of the Lord, which the Lord has said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Now, I'll be honest, and as I look, there's no place that says that God ever said that to David. It's actually a statement. I don't think God would say, you shall do to him as it seem good to you. But here the men, they see Saul right there. They say, God must have set this up. I mean, here it is. I mean, so David there goes stealthily to Saul, cuts off a piece of his robe, and then slips back. Which, let me just say, he had to have been pretty quiet. I mean, that's pretty impressive, right? I mean, to be able to sneak up there, I mean, I'm just, I was pretty impressed as I was thinking about that. I know my kids try to um, sneak up on me all the time. Eliana loves to do that. She does pretty good, actually, a lot of times. We don't realize where she's at. But here David sneaks up on Saul, does not kill him, though. Cuts off his robe and comes back. And even after doing that, David felt like he should not have. But here's the truth, the fourth truth that I want you to get, and very important is circumstances would not always lead you down the correct path. When it comes to deciding God's will, circumstances will not always lead you down the correct path. Because to be honest, circumstances seemed, I mean, it seemed like God led Saul. I mean, there were tons of caves in En Gedi. He could have went any, any other cave. But instead, he goes into the cave where David and his men are at. I mean, that seems like circumstances have just led this. I mean, here's David. David could have walked up and easily have killed Saul right then. Circumstances here is a way, but they're not God's way. David had a path really here to skip all his suffering, to be done with the nightmare, but it was not God's way. It was a shortcut. 
I mean, you think about it. If he would have walked and killed Saul right there, he then would have become king. I I mean, he knew he was going to be king. He knew that was going to take place. And so, I mean, who would have said wrong if he would have went and killed Saul at that time right there? But circumstances are not always going to lead you down the correct path. And when it comes to determining God's will, they're not going to do that. If they're not a shortcut, and that's what David could have done here. This could have been a shortcut to get him to be the king quicker. Remember as a kid, as you used to play um, Super Mario Brothers, and that you could go to the shortcuts to warp to you know, the eighth level, or the eighth world, like really quick? Doesn't that sound nice sometimes in life? You know, you're going through a tough time, you're going through tough circumstances, you're like, man, if I could just warp to another level, this would be great. David here had that opportunity, but he did not take it. I I read in a book this week, author said this, we must recognize that God would not always use the most direct or convenient route in carrying out his plan. I'll be honest, I don't like that very much. I like convenience, if I were to be honest. I like it when things kind of line up nice, (laughs) and things are kind of easy. I like convenience, but God does not always use convenience in the direct route when carrying out his plan, and we can get into trouble personally when we think that circumstances are always going to tell us what God's will is. You know, all the stars, they're lining up. This must be what it is. I mean, for David, it seemed like that. His men said, here, do it. This is it. God's put Saul right in front of you. This must be what God wants. Well, David doesn't. Why not? We'll continue in our text. And after David even just even cut off the little bit of Saul's robe, he said, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointed. So it says it twice there. He said, he is still the Lord's anointed. He is the king. I'm not going to do this. You know, listen, I I think we do it a a lot sometimes that we determine God's will just in our circumstances. Can circumstances help us determine God's will? Yes. But are they supreme in determining God's will? No. We, We run to them way too quick sometimes. And that's what we see Saul's or David's men here do. They were so convinced, it says there in verse 7, so David persuaded his men with these words. That means that he had to really go after it. He had to really get them to see. It wasn't just that he said, guys, we're not going to do this. No, he had to persuade them. That means that they were like, no, David, you should kill him. This is God's will. No, listen, he is the Lord's anointed. I'm not touching him. Here's the next thing you need to see about truths of God's will is beware of, beware of interpreting God's will off of emotions. Because that's what Saul's, that's what David's men do, do here, right? David, we could be done. We're hiding in a cave. The person who's after us is right there. Kill him. Listen, beware of interpreting God's will off of emotions. I think David's men, they were emotionally ready to end the wandering of the wilderness. But David had to persuade them and say, listen, we don't touch the Lord's anointed. God gave us our emotions. They're good things. In worship, we should let our emotions go free. But when it comes to God's will, they're usually not the best gauge in life. Verse 8, continuing our story. David then comes out of the cave, and we won't read it all, but David comes to Saul and stands up and says, Saul, I'm David, and listen, I'm holding your robe up here. Saul kind of looks down and realizes that David was that close to him. And David then goes on and to say here to Saul, listen, I have done nothing wrong, Saul. You be the judge. Let the Lord be the judge. I have not done anything to you, and I could have killed you, but I will not touch you. Verse 16, and as soon as David had finished speaking these words, Saul said to him, in this, is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. 
and said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. Underline that line. Saul comes to his senses, it seems like. It kind of seems as you study the life of Saul, it kind of goes back and forth where he doesn't get it, and then he does. And here he weeps and realizes, yes, you have repaid evil. I have tried to give you evil, and you have given me good. And so he tells David, I will not touch you. I will not kill you, which he goes back on that and does it later on. But he says, I will not do it. He said, will you just promise that when you become king, in verse 20, he says, you will become king. You will have it. It will be established in your hand. But when you do, please don't wipe my family out. And David says, yes. But here's one more truth that I want you to get out of this text. And that is this. It is always God's will to forgive. It's always God's will to forgive. We see David did that here. As he, gave e- as he gave good where Saul gave evil. So when we talk about timeless truths of God's will, listen, it is always God's will for you to forgive. Jeremiah, how do, we, how do you know that? How do we know that we're supposed to give like that? Well, we can go to the New Testament, Ephesians 4, 32. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Listen, our standard of forgiveness is what Christ has done for us. So if Christ has forgiven you, has Christ forgiven us, church? Yes. So if Christ has forgiven us, that's our standard of forgiveness, so that means we should forgive. We forgive like Christ has forgiven us. It is always God's will for us to forgive. We, we forgive like Christ did. And, and you see, David, he was a picture of Christ. We've talked about that. He was a little Christ. He was a picture to show us. And, and yes, was Christ so much better? Yes. But look at even in this chapter. Yes, David was anointed king, but not everyone saw that yet. Christ was king, but when he walked this earth, not everyone bowed before him. David was betrayed by his own people. Christ, as he walked this earth, was betrayed by those he created. David lived in the wilderness. Jesus, it says, had no place to lay his head. David could have had his kingdom right then. I mean, if he would have killed Saul, it would have been done, and he would have had his kingdom. In Matthew chapter 4, we see Satan tempt Jesus and say, listen, you can have the kingdom now. You don't have to go through the death. David forgave the one that persecuted him, Christ forgave us, the one that put us on the cross, as we put him on the cross. I mean. You see, David and Christ show us how we are supposed to live. And for those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, we are called to forgive like Christ forgave, like David shows us here. It is always God's will to forgive. Let me ask you, church, is there someone that you need to forgive today? Is there someone that you are repaying evil for? Even though you say, Jeremiah, they have repaid evil to me. Do we repay evil for evil? No. It is always God's will for us to forgive. And you say, Jeremiah, I can see that clearly. I get that in the scriptures But how do we know for things that aren't as black and white of what God's will is? How how do we know what that is supposed to look like? Let let, let me give you, if I can, just a couple truths of how do we find God's will today. And and if I can, let me put it in a couple buckets just to start here. And and then I'll give you the six things. When we're talking about God's will, I, I think there is a general will of God. And that general will of God is like, don't kill Don't steal, don't commit adultery. It's pretty much the black and white we see that we don't really have to debate too much about, that we know we can put it in that bucket. This is just the general will of God that we know we're not supposed to do this. Then then I will say there's an individual will of God. And and that's the one we wrestle with a lot because that's the questions like, who do you marry and when do do I choose this job or do I buy this car or do I buy this house? What does God, does God want me to move? And how many would say right now that in your life that you are walking down a road that you are trying to figure out God's will in some area of your life you're asking him about right now? Raise your hand. Okay, great. And we have those. But the last bucket I would say is just the daily will of God. I'm going to give you six truths about the individual will of God. 
The daily will of God is this. This is just the spirit-led life, the daily choices that we make. Listen, I don't think as you're driving down the road and you've got to get into the other lane that you've got to stop and go through six steps on how to determine God's will if you should get into the other lane. No, you get into the other lane. I don't think as you go to eat that you have to determine as you do I have a salad or a burger. No, you walk in the Spirit, okay? So don't take this too far. Listen, we are supposed to get up every day and walk in the Spirit. So those choices that you make, I don't think you have to ask God every day, okay, do I wear this clothes or this clothes? No, if you walk in the Spirit. But when it comes to these individual bigger choices in our life and things that we are trying to determine God's will for, well, what are we supposed to do? Let me give you six things as we close. Here's the first thing is pray to God. So I think that's a no-brainer. But sometimes we forget that one. And here, understand this. As we pray, it is surrendering to his will. Put the word surrender next to that. Because a lot of times when we pray, we really are going to God telling him what we want. Why would God tell you what his will is, is really you have already determined it yourself. You are just going and asking him or quote unquote asking him just in case someone says, did you pray about it? And go, yep, I prayed about it. And God said, yes. You see, a lot of times when we pray about God's will, it's we already know what we want to do. We just are quote unquote good Christians. And so we got to pray and ask God about it. But I think a lot of times it gets stuck right there because our prayer to God is not out of one, out of a surrender. Our prayer to God is not, God, what do you want? Our prayer is, God, this is what I want to do, so now will you bless it? So surrender is so important in that. There's a verse in Proverbs 16.3 that says this, commit your works unto the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Committing your works unto the Lord is that surrender. It's giving, saying, God, this is yours, it's not mine. And let God establish your thoughts of what you should do. It's not coming to God telling him what you're supposed to do. No, it's coming in surrender to him. So pray to God. Here's the second thing, is seek biblical principles. You might not find the exact verse of what you're supposed to do, but you can find principles to help you make a wise decision. And so we seek big, big, blah, 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 blah. biblical, thank you, biblical principles. God is never going to ask you to do something that against the principles of his word. Do you hear me? God's never going to ask you to do something that goes against the principles of his word. Uh, let me just give you an example. When it comes to money, listen, God is not going to tell you to go out and buy some brand new car when you can barely provide for your family, when you're not saving faithfully or giving faithfully. He's not going to because the principles of God's word show us how we should handle money and what the order of importance things should be. And so God's not going to tell you to do that. But a lot of times we don't know the principles of God's word. We don't understand the principles of God's word. But they say, well, it doesn't specifically say I can't go buy this 2020 vehicle. That's true, it doesn't. But if we take the principles of God's word and understand that, as some would say, as current as the morning newspaper this book is, is because we can take those principles to help us figure out what God wants. See, God gave us the method of how we do it. But we have to be in this book right here, and we have to know what those are. God talks about how to live in, in a wise way and how we live wisely. Do, do you know those, and do we go to the scriptures to figure out those? Seek biblical principles. Here's the third thing. Ask godly advice. Ask godly advice. Proverbs 15, says, Without counsel, plans fall, but with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there is no guidance, the people's falls, but an abundance of counselors, there is safety. It amazes me how many people will make or big moves, big decisions in their life without seeking godly advice. Listen, those verses to me say there is safety when you go and ask counselors for advice. I don't know about you, but I don't trust myself. It's easy for me to make a decision off my own emotions. So it's important for me when I make a big decision to go and to ask people around me, hey, well, what do you think? You think this is wise? If I got four or five people that are godly, that are wise, that say, yes, I, think, I don't see any you know, red flags, I, I feel much better walking down that road. But a lot of times we don't want to ask anybody because we're afraid they're going to say. 
I, I remember when, um, just as an example, I remember when I was uh, first met Stephanie and I uh, was thinking about, do I you know, date her? Do we walk down that road? And so I went to my parents and, and just tried to get their counsel. And I said, Mom, Dad, what do you guys think? You know, I kind of interested in Stephanie. Do you think I should um, you know, pursue her? And they looked at me and said, you better hurry up before someone else does. Okay, that, that was good. I asked someone else, and they're like, yes, you better do this. I remember when we moved here to Pittsburgh that I asked numerous people, do you believe this is, what, this is the kind of situation? This is what's taking place? Do you feel like God's call? Do you feel like I should take this step and move there? And, and yes, there was no one that said, uh, that said, no, you should not go there. So I continued down that road. Listen, seeking, ask godly advice is so important when it comes to determining God's will. Now, here's the fourth one. Study circumstances around you. You say, Jeremiah, you said earlier that circumstances not always lead you down the correct path. That is true. They may not always. But sometimes God does use circumstances. We even see that in the scriptures. My caution to you, and that's why I put here, study circumstances around you. Because don't always let it determine on circumstances. But God does use circumstances at times to show us what his will is. And then number five, experience peace. If you're in line with the Holy Spirit and he's going to give you peace, that you should do it. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Don't, don't miss that. Don't force yourself to do it. If you don't have peace in doing it, and that's probably the Holy Spirit saying, don't do it. And so that peace needs to be there. Say, Jeremiah, sometimes I feel like I can trick myself in thinking I have peace when I really don't. Well, that's why all those other ones are there. That's why I seek biblical principles. That's why I ask godly advice. That's why I study the circumstances around me. And, and then, yes, if there is a peace, you say, what if I've done all that? What if I pray and I really believe that surrender and said, God, no will of my own. What do you want? I've gone to the Bible and I don't see anything that goes against me doing this. I've asked godly advice and no one has you know, put up the red flag or no one has said anything. And, and the circumstances around me seem like it is walking down that road. I do have a peace. What should I do? Do it and trust. Listen to me. If God is our Father and you truly have gone through that with that type of heart and God is our Father and we're starting to walk down a road that's not right, do you think he'll stop us? Yes. If I know my kids are walking down the right, wrong road and they've asked and, they've gone, and, they've, and they're walking down the road, I'm going to stop them. Listen, I think sometimes we overcomplicate God's will too much. Some people, you just kind of run ahead and you never ask. Some people, you are so careful. Oh, no, I don't know if this is, no, no, no. Listen, just trust and do it. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. I, I really believe that if you walk through these steps, that I believe God will give you the thoughts that you're supposed to have. And, and so if that is to walk down this road, then walk down this road. It's so important that, and just, just do it. Use the method, just like we see David here. God gave him the methods that he was supposed to. God's given us the methods. We have it in this book of what we're supposed to do. How will you determine God's will? Will you just kind of let yourself do it? And just kind of say, nope, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to, you know, I might do a couple of these little things. Are you going to? Say, God, this is what the word says. I'm going to pray. I'm going to surrender to you. I I'm going to seek the biblical principles of your word. I'm going to ask for that godly advice. I'm going to study the circumstances around me. I want to have that peace in me. And God, if those are all there, then I will do it. And I will trust you. That if for some reason I'm off in all this, that you're going to step in and show me not to do it. But sometimes we just have to do it in trust. It's okay, God, I've walked through what your scripture says. Now let's take the step. And don't overcomplicate it. I remember when my wife and I moved to Florida. I um, was a youth pastor down there for five years and didn't know the pastor, didn't know really, I mean, Basically, both moves that we did from Florida even here to Pittsburgh were, were kind of moves that uh, there wasn't, we didn't know anybody, we didn't know what was going to take place. And, and I remember going through these and just making sure what God said and prayed and asked godly advice. And 
it really, for both moves, when we went to Florida, we moved here to Pittsburgh. It really was, okay, God, there's no one saying no. There's, there's no red flag in my heart. And so we're just going to go. I, I didn't see everything. I didn't see how it was all going to work out. But it was just, we go. Listen, sometimes God just wants us to take the right precautions and, and then move forward. How about you? You can be a hearer of God's word today, or you can be a doer and a hearer of God's word. Listen to the truth and obey God's word. We bow here and close your eyes with me. With heads bowed and eyes closed, many of you raised your hand a second ago and said that you have something that you're praying about, trying to figure out what God's will is. Then right now, why don't you just start by going to God and surrendering to him and saying, God, I want your will and not my will in this. That's the first step. And maybe you haven't done that yet. Well, you've at least gone to God and said, God, what do you want? God, what is your will in this area? Why is God going to walk you down the road to show you his will if you have never really surrendered to him and what he wants and not you trying to tell him what you want. Listen, God's word is its alive, it's active, it, it, it is clear. It's just are we going to obey it and listen to it? Are we going to use the methods just like David did? David didn't make a move without asking God. We see that. So will you do that in your life? Let's stand together as we pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the life of David and what you're teaching us through him. I thank you that we're not here to, uh, you're not here to try to confuse us, God. That if we'll take the steps that you've given to us in your word, that I believe we can figure out your will for us in these areas of what we do. And yes, let's walk every day filled with the Spirit and and in the Spirit. But God, as these big decisions, they come up, God, will you give us, yes, the patience to make sure that we do seek these things out. But God, give us the obedience to what you want and not what we want. So I thank you, and God, let us put to practice now what you've taught us, what you have showed us, and God, let us go out and live for you and you alone today. In the name of Jesus, I do pray, amen. Church, let me just invite you, Wednesday nights, Fresh Encounter, I hope you'll be here. Our elders will be leading us in communion, we'll have a great time together as we worship and spend some time in prayer. Again, no one's going to force you to pray out loud or anything, um, but we do believe the importance of praying, worshiping, taking communion together. Uh, child care is provided. The youth will be going on also. So I hope that you'll come and um, be here. 7 o'clock goes to about 8.15, but um, this Wednesday. So God bless you. Know that you are loved.